Hello, my darling, and welcome to today's story time. Carter sailed out of Dilath Lean one early morning when the tide turned and saw the first rays of sunrise on the thin, angular towers of that dismal, basalt town. And for two days they sailed eastward inside of green coasts and saw often the pleasant fishing towns that climbed up steeply with their red roofs and chimney pots from old dreaming wharves and beaches where nets lay drying. But on the third day, they turned sharply south, where the roll of the water was stronger, and soon passed from sight of any land. On the fifth day, the sailors were nervous, but the captain apologized for their fears, saying that the ship was about to pass over the weedy walls and broken columns of a sunken city too old for memory, and that when the water was clear, one could see so many moving shadows in that deep place that simple folk disliked it. He admitted, moreover, that many ships had been lost in that part of the sea, having been hailed when quite close to it, but never seen again. That night, the moon was very bright, and one could see a way down into the water. There was so little wind that the ship could not move much, and the ocean was very calm. Looking over the rail, Carter saw many fathoms deep the dome of a great temple, and in front of it an avenue of unnatural sphinxes leading to what was once a public square. Dolphins sported merrily in and out of the ruins, and porpoises reveled clumsily here and there, sometimes coming to the surface and leaping clear out of the sea. As the ship drifted on a little, the floor of the ocean rose in hills, and one could clearly mark the lines of an ancient climbing street and the washed down walls of myriad little houses. Then the suburbs appeared, and finally a great lone building on a hill of simpler architecture than the other structures and in much better repair. It was dark and low and covered four sides of a square with a tower at each corner, a paved court in the center, small curious round windows all over it. Probably it was of basalt, though weeds draped the greater part and such was its lonely and impressive place on that far hill, that it may have been a temple or monastery. Some phosphorescent fish inside it gave the small round windows an aspect of shining, and Carter did not blame the sailors much for their fears. Then, by the watery moonlight, he noticed an odd high monolith in the middle of that central court, and he saw that something was tied to it, and when, after getting a telescope from the captain's cabin, he saw that the bound thing was a sailor in the silk robes of Oriob, head downward and without any eyes. He was glad that a rising breeze soon took the ship away to more healthy parts of the sea. The next day, they spoke with the ship with violet sails bound for Zar, in the land of forgotten dreams with bulbs of strange colored lilies for cargo. And, on the evening of the eleventh day, they came in sight of the Isle of Oriob, with the Granach rising, jagged, and snow-crowned in the distance. Oriob is a very great isle, and its port of Baharna, a mighty city. The wharves of Baharna are of porphyry, and the city rises in great stone terraces behind them, having streets of steps that are frequently arched over buildings, and the bridges between buildings. There is a great canal which goes under the whole city in a tunnel with granite gates, then leads to the inland lake of Yath, on whose farther shore are the vast clay-brick ruins of a primal city, whose name is not remembered. As the ship drew into the harbor at evening, the twin beacons Thon and Thaw gleamed in welcome, and in all the million windows of Baharna's terraces, 
Mellow lights peeped out quietly and gradually as the stars peep out overhead in the dusk, till that steep and climbing seaport became a glittering constellation hung between the stars of heaven and the reflections of those stars in the still harbor. The captain, after landing, made Carter a guest in his own small house on the shore of Yath, where the rear of the town slopes down to it, and his wife and servants brought some strange, toothsome foods for the traveler's delight. And in the days after that, Carter asked for rumors and legends of Negronic in all the taverns and public places where lava gatherers and image makers meet, but could find no one who had been up the higher slopes or seen the carven face. Negronic was a hard mountain with only an accursed valley behind it. And besides, no one could ever depend on the certainty that night gaunts are altogether fabulous. When the captain sailed back to Dialathleen, Carter took quarters in an ancient tavern, opening on an alley of steps in the original part of the town. It was built of brick and resembled the ruins of Yath's farther shore. Here he laid his plans for the ascent of Degronic and correlated all he had learned from the lava gatherers about the roads thither. The keeper of the tavern was a very old man and had heard so many legends that he was a great help. He even took Carter to an upper room in that ancient house and showed him a crude picture which a traveler had scratched on the clay wall in the olden days when men were bolder and less reluctant to visit Negronic's highest slopes. The old tavern keeper's great-grandfather had heard from his great-grandfather that the traveler who scratched that picture had climbed Negronic and seen the carven face, here drawing it for others to behold. Carter had very great doubts, since the large rough features on the wall were hasty and careless and wholly overshadowed by a crowd of little companion shapes in the worst possible taste. Horns and wings and claws and curling tails. At last, having gained all the information he was likely to gain in the taverns and public places of Baharna, Carter hired a zebra and set out one morning on the road by Yath shore for those inland parts where in towers stony Negronic. On his right were rolling hills and pleasant orchards and neat little stone farmhouses. And he was much reminded of those fertile fields that flank the sky. By evening, he was near the nameless ancient ruins on Yoth's farther shore. And though old lava gatherers had warned him not to camp there at night, he tethered his zebra to a curious pillar before a crumbling wall and laid his blanket in a sheltered corner between some carvings whose meanings none could decipher. Around him he wrapped another blanket, for the nights are cold in Oriop. And when upon awakening once, he thought he felt the wings of some insect brushing his face, so he covered his head altogether and slept in peace until roused by the Maga birds in distant resin groves. The sun had just come up over the great slope where on leagues of primal brick foundations and worn walls and occasional cracked pillars and pedestals stretched down desolate to the shore of Yoth. Carter looked about for his tethered zebra but great was his dismay to see that the docile beast was stretched prostrate beside the curious pillar to which it had been tied. And still greater was he vexed upon finding that the steed was quite dead, with its blood all sucked away through a singular wound in its throat. His pack had been disturbed and several shiny knickknacks taken away and all around on the dusty soil were great webbed footprints 
which he could not in any way account. Legends and warnings of lava gatherers occurred to him, and he thought of what had brushed his face in the night. Then he shouldered his pack himself and strode on toward Negronic, though not without a shiver when he saw close to him as the highway passed through the ruins, a great gaping arch low in the wall of an old temple, with steps leading down into darkness farther than he could peer. His course now led uphill through wilder and partly wooded country, and he saw only the huts of charcoal burners and the camps of those who gathered resin from the groves. The whole air was fragrant with balsam, and all the maga birds sang blithely as they flashed their seven colors in the sun. Near sunset, he came on a new camp of lava gatherers, returning with laden sacks from Negronic's lower slopes. And here he also camped listening to the songs and tales of the men, and overhearing what they whispered about was a companion they had lost. He climbed high to reach a mass of fine lava above him, and at nightfall did not return to his fellows. When they looked for him the next day, they found only his turban, nor was there any sign on the crags below that he had fallen. They did not search any more, because the old men among them said it would be of no use. No one ever found what the night gaunts took, though those beasts themselves were so uncertain as to be almost fabulous. Carter asked them if the night gaunts sucked blood and liked shiny things and left web footprints but they all shook their heads negatively and seemed frightened. When he saw how taciturn they had become, he asked them no more, but went to sleep in his blanket. The next day he rose with the lava gatherers and exchanged farewells as they rode west, and he rode east on a zebra he had bought of them. Their older men gave him blessings and warnings, and told him he'd better not climb too high on Negronic. But while he thanked them heartily, he was in no way dissuaded. For still did he feel that he must find the gods on unknown Kadath, and win from them a way to that haunting and marvelous city in the sunset. By noon, after a long uphill ride, he came upon some abandoned brick villages of the hill people who had once dwelt thus close to Negronic and carved images from its smooth lava. Here they had dwelt till the days of the old tavern keeper's grandfather, but about that time they felt their presence was disliked. Their homes had crept even up the mountain slope, and the higher they built, the more people they would miss when the sun rose. At last, they decided it would be better to leave altogether, since things were sometimes glimpsed in the darkness, which no one could interpret favorably. So in the end, all of them went down to the sea and dwelt in Baharna, inhabiting a very old quarter and teaching their sons the old art of image-making, which to this day they carry on. It was from these children of the exiled hill people that Carter had heard the best tales about Negronic when searching through Baharna's ancient taverns. All this time, the great gaunt side of Negronic was looming up higher and higher as Carter approached it. There were sparse trees on the lower slope and feeble shrubs above them, and then the bare, hideous rock rose spectral into the sky to mix with frost and ice and eternal snow. Carter could see the rifts of ruggedness of that somber stone and did not welcome the prospect of climbing it. In places, there were solid streams of lava and scoriac heaps that littered slopes and ledges. 
ninety eons ago, before even the gods had danced upon its pointed peak. That mountain had spoken with fire, and roared with the voices of the inner thunders. Now it towered all silent and sinister, bearing on the hidden side that secret titan image whereof rumor told. And there were caves in that mountain, which might be empty and alone with elder darkness, or might, if legend spoke truly, hold horrors of a form not to be surmised. The ground sloped upward to the foot of Necronic, thinly covered with scrub oaks and ash trees, and strewn with bits of rock, lava, and ancient cinder. There were the charred embers of many camps, where the lava gatherers were wont to stop, and several crude altars which they had built either to propitiate the great gods, or to ward off what they dreamed of in the Gronix high passes and the Brinthian caves. That evening, Carter reached the farthest most pile of embers and camped for the night, tethering his zebra to his sapling. He wrapped himself well in his blanket before going to sleep. And all through the night, a vunith howled distantly from the shore of some hidden pool. But Carter felt no fear of that amphibious terror, since he had been told with certainty that not one of them dares even approach the slopes of Negronic. In the clear sunshine of morning, Carter began the long ascent, taking his zebra as far as that useful beast could go. He tied it to a stunted ash tree when the floor of the thin road became too steep. Thereafter, he scrambled up alone. First, through the forest, with its ruins of old villages and overgrown clearings, and then over the tough grass where anemic shrubs grew here and there. He regretted coming clear of the trees, since the slope was very precipitous, and the whole thing rather dizzying. At length, he began to discern all the countryside spread out beneath him whenever he looked around. Deserted huts of the image makers, groves of resin trees, camps of those who had gathered from them, the woods where prismatic magas nest and sang, and even a hint very far away of the shores of Yath, and of those forbidding ancient ruins whose name is forgotten. He found it best not to look around, and kept on climbing. And climbing till the shrubs became very sparse and there was often nothing but the tough grass to cling to then the soil became meager with great patches of bare rock cropping out and now and then the nest of a condor in a crevice finally there was nothing at all but the bare rock and had it not been very rough and weathered he could scarcely have ascended any farther Knobs, ledges, and pinnacles, however, helped greatly. And it was cheering to see occasionally the sign of some lava gatherer scratched clumsily in the friable stone, and know that wholesome human creatures had been here before him. After a certain height, the presence of man was further shown by handholds and footholds hewn where they were needed, and by little quarries and excavations where some choice vein or stream of lava had found. In one place, a narrow ledge had been chopped artificially to an especially rich deposit far to the right of the main line of ascent. Once or twice, Carter dared to look around and was almost stunned by the spread of landscape below. All the island betwixt him and the coast lay open to his sight, with Baharna's stone terraces, and the smoke of chimneys mystical in the distance. And beyond that, the illimitable southern sea, with all its curious secrets. Thus far, 
there had been much winding around the mountain, so that the farther and carven side was still hidden. Carter now saw a ledge running upward and to the left, which seemed to head the way he wished. This course he took in the hope that it might prove continuous. After ten minutes he saw it was indeed no cul-de-sac, but that it led steeply on in an arc which would, unless suddenly interrupted or deflected, bring him after a few hours climbing to that unknown southern slope which overlooked the desolate crags and the accursed valley of lava. As new country came into view below him, he saw that it was bleaker and wilder than those seaward lands he had traversed. The mountainside, too, was somewhat different, being here pierced by curious cracks and caves, not found on the straighter route he had left. Some of these were above him, and some beneath him, all opening on sheerly perpendicular cliffs, and wholly unreachable by the feet of man. The air was very cold now, but so hard was the climbing he did not mind it. Only the increasing rarity bothered him, and he thought that, perhaps, it was this which had turned the heads of other travelers and excited those absurd tales of the night gaunts whereby they explained the loss of such climbers as must have fallen from these perilous paths. He was not much impressed by travelers' tales, but had a good curved scimitar in case of any trouble. All lesser thoughts were lost in the wish to see that carven face, which might set him on the track of the gods, atop unknown Kadah. At last, in the fearsome iciness of upper space. He came round fully to the hidden sign of Negronic and saw in infinite gulfs below him the lesser crags and sterile abysses of lava which marked the olden wrath of the Great Ones. There was unfolded, too, a vast expanse of country to the south, but it was a desert land without fair fields or cottage chimneys and seemed to have no ending. No trace of the sea was visible on this side, for Oriob is a great island. Black caverns and odd crevices were still numerous on the sheer vertical cliffs, but none of them was accessible to a climber. There now loomed aloft a great beetling mass which hampered the upward view. Carter was for a moment shaken with doubt, lest it prove impassable. Poised in windy insecurity miles above earth, with only space and death on one side, and only slippery walls of rock on the other, he knew for a moment the fear that makes men shun Negronic's hidden side. He could not turn around, yet the sun was already low, if there were no way aloft, the night would find him crouching there still, and the dawn would not find him at all. But there was a way, and he saw it in due season. Only a very expert dreamer could have used those imperceptible footholds, yet to Carter they were sufficient. Surmounting now the outward hanging rock, he found the slope above much easier than that below, since a great glacier's melting had left the generous space with loam and ledges. To the left, a precipice dropped straight from unknown heights to unknown depths, with a cave's dark mouth just out of reach above him. Elsewhere, however, the mountain slanted back strongly and even gave him space to lean and rest. He felt from the chill that he must be near the snow line. He looked up to see what glittering pinnacles might be shining in that late, ruddy sunlight. Surely enough, there was the snow uncounted thousands of feet above, and below it a great beetling crag like that he had just climbed, hanging there forever in bold outline, 
black against the white of the frozen peak. And when he saw that crag, he gasped and cried out loud and clutched at the jagged rock in awe. For the titan bulge had not stayed as Earth's dawn had shaped it, but gleamed red and stupendous in the sunset with the carved and polished features of a god. Stern and terrible shone that face, that sunset lit with fire. How vast it was, no mind can ever measure. But Carter knew at once that man did not fashion it. It was a god chiseled by the hands of gods, and it looked down haughty and majestic upon the seeker. Rumor had said it was strange and not to be mistaken. And Carter saw that it was indeed so. For those long, narrow eyes and long, lobed ears and that thin nose and pointed chin all spoke of a race that is not of men, but of gods. He clung overawed in that lofty and perilous eerie, even though it was this which he had expected and come to find. For there is in a god's face more of a marvel than prediction can tell. When that face is vaster than a great temple, and seen looking down at sunset in the cryptic silences of that upper world, from whose dark lava it was divinely hewn of old, the marvel is so strong that none may escape it. Here, too, was the added marvel recognition. For although he had planned to search all dreamland over for those whose likeness to this face might mark them as God's children, he now knew that he need not do so. Certainly, the great face carven on that mountain was of no strange sort, but the kin of such as he had seen often in the taverns of the seaport, Silifayes which lies in Uth Nargai, beyond the Tenarian hills, and is ruled over by that King Chironis, whom Carter once knew in waking life. Every year sailors with such a face came in dark ships from the north to trade their onyx for the carved jade, and spun gold, and little red singing birds of Celephias, and it was clear that these could be no others than the half-gods he saw where they dwelt, there must be the cold waste lie close, and within it, unknown Kadath and its onyx castle for the Great Ones. So, to Selephais he must go, far distant from the Isle of Oriob, and in such parts as would take him back to Dilathleen, and up the sky to the bridge by Nier, and again into the enchanted wood of the Zugs whence the way would bend northward through the garden lands by Ukranos to the gilded spires of Thrawn, where he might find a galleon bound to the Serenarian Sea. But dusk was now thick, and the great carven face looked down even sterner in shadow. Perched on that ledge, night found the seeker, and in the blackness he might neither go down nor go up, but only stand and cling and shiver in that narrow place till daytime came, praying to keep awake, lest sleep loose his hold and send him down the dizzy miles of air to the crags and sharp rocks of the accursed valley. The stars came out, but save for them there was only black nothingness in his eyes nothingness leagued with death, against whose beckoning he might do no more than cling to the rocks and lean back away from an unseen brink. The last thing of earth that he saw in the gloaming was a condor soaring close to the westward precipice beside him, and darting, screaming away, when it came near the cave whose mouth yawned just out of reach. Suddenly, without a warning sound in the dark, Carter felt his curved scimitar drawn stealthily out of his belt 
by some unseen hand. Then he heard it clatter down over the rocks below. And between him and the Milky Way, he thought he saw a very terrible outline of something noxiously thin and horned and tailed and bowing. Other things, too, had begun to blot out patches of stars west of him, as if a flock of vague entities were flapping thickly and silently out of that inaccessible cave on the face of the precipice. Then a sort of cold, rubbery arm seized his neck, and something else seized his feet, and he was lifted inconsiderately up and swung about in space. Another minute, and the stars were gone, and Carter knew that the night gaunts had got him. And this, my darling, ends our story time for today. As always, I hope that you have very sweet and creepy dreams.